Hi there, everybody, and welcome to the Run the Alps Rendezvous with me, Hilary Girardi. For those of you who don't know me yet or haven't watched a rendezvous before, I'm a longtime friend of, of Run the Alps, um, and I am a professional endurance athlete living here in the Chamonix Valley. Um, my specialty is what we call in the business uh, sky running, which I encourage you to Google it. Buzz, I'm sure already knows it, but um, but basically I usually say you gotta use your hands, scramble a bit at some point. So that's kind of what I like to do. Um, for those people who are familiar with rendezvous, and Buzz is not one of them, uh, basically we invite uh, different characters from the trail running community to come and have a chat with us when we when they're coming through the Chamonix Valley. Today in particular, we're joining you from the hub uh, in Chamonix. And so just a little explanation of what that is. It's kind of a base camp for trail running. Um, it's a place where people can come and stay, rent rooms or bunk beds, um, and really a great place to use as a community and kind of go out on you know, spokes, I guess, of uh, trail running all around, all around the valley. Now you, Buzz, how do we sum up who Buzz is? Maybe I'll make him talk about himself, <laughs> but probably Ooh. in the interest of, you know, like not making him blush too much um, or toot his own horn, um, it is tough to sum him up. Somebody with such a long career in legendary and trail running, both on sort of the business side, whether it's La Sportiva North America team manager or uh, directing run or ultimate direction for a long time, or you know, just like mention really quickly kind of founding the FKT movement <laughs> right. uh, and podcast, but also big achievements in running more generally, uh, whether it's the Colorado Trail or the John Muir Trail, setting records on those. So, Wow, you're um, good. Thank you, Hillary. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate I did, I that. Read, I read a couple things before, <laughs> but again, I couldn't sum them all up. Um, but so anyway, I actually really wanted to have you on for a rendezvous because um, while you're here in Chimney, I understand that you are, you know, you've moved into a new age category for running. Right. So you decided to come here. I'm and shamelessly like, poaching my age group. Yeah, yeah. Well, you can win cheese. So There's cheese. I just brought in cheese to the hub today. Uh-huh. Actually, I brought in some pasta, too. I got cheese and pasta at the last race. That's pretty awesome. And I'm you know, really glad that this is going to be posted online later. So sorry guys, it'll all be gone by the time you get here. Um, really quickly though, last thing I'll say is just what you can expect while you're listening to this. We're gonna start just kind of with a little conversation, uh, general questions, what the heck is Buzz doing here? Um, I've got some rapid fire questions okay. for you as well. And then we're gonna take some audience questions. Normally, again, if we're streaming live, people write in questions, but we put a little call out for questions before today. Okay. So I've got a few, nothing too embarrassing in the end. So I'm a little disappointed. Um, but anyway, I wanna start with you. Tell me a little bit, what the heck are you doing here? <laughs> in Indeed. Well, one thing I'm doing here, you said, you know, radiates out like a spoke, but really it's kind of like, uh, I mean, right now we, you can't see it, but if that camera was tilted in that direction, you would barely see the tops of the mountains, wouldn't you? Yeah. Well, it's you know, up. It's a neck trainer. I mean, you need a chiropractor when you're walking around Chamonix. It's true. It's true. Actually, the last Run the Alps uh, rendezvous we had was with Neil McLean Martin from the Clinique du Sport, one of the best physios. Mm -hmm. And when I moved here, I like immediately sought him out to help me deal with the crick in my neck. Right. Where are yeah. we going? Or we're we going like that. <laughs> yeah. But as you said, it is a trail running capital. It is Doug Mayer, the founder uh, and co-owner of Run the Alps, noted when I first arrived here, there are now more runners in Chamonix than there are climbers. That's really different because this used to be a mountaineering center, as you know. I mean, Mount Blanc is right there. Yeah. The Dru, you know, the, the, yeah. some of the most Grand Girard, the f most famous alpine climbs in the world are right here. And yet now there's a lot of runners. Yeah. Mount Blanc Marathon is it two, no, three, three weeks ago. My time flies when... You're having fun? Exactly. And there's 10,000 people in town for that. That's kind of a lot. And it's uh, become a hub. And obviously UTMB, I can't even keep track of it now. There's like seven races as part of that. No one can even figure it out anymore. So at any rate, it's now a trail running capital. 
and Doug Myers got the Run the Alps trips based out of here. I'd say that was a pretty good choice on the uh, company name, you know. Run the Alps, yeah, it kind of makes a certain amount of sense. Yeah. And you mentioned we're here at the hub. Look at this. This is cush. This isn't like being in a, you know, uh, some of the hotels are a little crushy, you know. It's kind of tight. They're loud, middle of the city. Yeah. We're out here. It's very pleasant. We got a nice little kitchen. I like staying here at the hub. I've been traveling around, I've been to the Dolmites, and the uh, Bernice Oberlin. I like coming here to the hub because I have a nice little room and I can go and cook food in the kitchen, which as athletes, we kind of picky about our food. You do, wait, so are you saying that you are not eating only fondue and oh. raclette while you're here? This is a correct assumption, Hillary. Oh, okay. And also the whole meat and Fondue's potatoes thing. experience, but. Well, the food here is great. <laughs> I mean, they got fresh produce. I mean, it's, it's, it's very good yeah. if you go out to the market and get it and bring it back. So I'm very happy with the hub. Good, good. But so you said you've been around, you've been here, you've been to the Dolomites, but what is, what is this trip? Doug turned it the uh, epic Run the Alps trip because they do group tours and custom tours, individual, in the Bernie's Overland and the Dolomites, various, the VFLI, uh, UT, uh, TMB, things like that but I we put together three so we're doing three trips with races mixed in between and so Doug actually helped me with the races because as you know there's a lot of races it's not like in the states in the states you know I'm kind of picky about these things some things don't really move me you come here it's like whoa look at that I mean everything is Hillary you know this everything <laughs> goes like that then it goes like that and that's kind of what I like we, you know we have that in common we have that in common yeah I mean, I'm only kind of, personally, I'm like a fake American trail runner because <laughs> I have I almost not run in the U.S. at all. Oh, largely, is that right? Largely because I started trail running after I moved ah. to France, but also because the style I like is steep and technical. Steep and technical. Yeah. And you yeah. got plenty of that here. Yeah. Plenty of that. Well, as it happens, me too. And so Doug helped me identify things. And of course, the Marathon du Mont Blanc is part of the Golden Trail series, pretty comparative, uh, competitive. So I kind of wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. He had bought a block of uh, entries. I was too late, but I got to pick up one of those entries. That was nice. kind of helpful. Way to go, Doug. I know it. <laughs> and so my trip is doing some races. I'm actually doing five races in the Alps, six in Europe. I am doing nine. We don't recommend this. <laughs> this is not recommended behavior. <laughs> this is true. Kids, don't try this at home or in the States. So my schedule was nine races in the span of 11 weeks. Wow, that's a lot. Now, I would say, you know, you kind of evoked the fact that one of, like, the style of racing is a bit different, but I also feel like the density of trail races yeah. is kind of different. So like if you wanted to do nine races in that much time in 11 weeks in the U.S., you'd probably have to be flying all over the place to get them all Well, in. no, no, we, we can't say it. No, there's tons of races. Okay. But here's a broad brush way of looking at it. We've always called it trail running. Mm -hmm. Here they've always called it mountain running. That's, that kind of says something right there. There isn't a lot of true mountain races. You kind of go out and run through the woods on trails, and it's really good. I, you know, I, we've, I've done it. But if you want to go up, this is a good place to do it. For example, in the States, of course, there's the rut, footies race up in Montana. Mm -hmm. There's the Broken Arrow Sky Race, which isn't that steep, actually. But, it, you know, it's a good, good event. That's what they're trying to do. Something people haven't heard of is the Kindle Mountain Run in Silverton. Ooh, I Every, don't know that one. I know. Everyone knows about Hard Rock, which goes around Silverton, but in Silverton, there is a, essentially a sky race taking place there. Very so, cool. Yeah, there's a few of them. But as you just said, the history here, the mountain culture, the style here is different. In general, I guess, you know, we've already, like, touched upon some of these differences a little bit. How do you feel like your trip is going? Well, it's gone very well. I think the it's weather, I think the weather's been really good, although we had this heat wave. So it's kind of the opposite of what you might expect. You're not getting rained out. It's just been kind of hot, but that's, we've all heard of this. We all hopefully are working on this. It's called global warming. We all have to, you know, vote for the right people. I'm gonna just say that right off the bat. We gotta just step up here, folks, and uh, vote your beliefs and practice your beliefs. But it's been kind of hot. 
things have been going well. And then I just got to say it right now, kind of dispel the beans. You know, 10 days ago, I got diagnosed with COVID. Yeah. Major bummer. And you know the BA95 uh, five variant is a lot more moderate. It's not like this semi-death sentence from two years ago. It's like having a really bad cold and really, really low energy. So it's I'm probably cramping your style a little. It's way cramping my style. And by the way, you know, Hill and I had this discussion, and I've been wearing an N95 mask, and I've been isolating, et cetera, et cetera. I'm actually following CDC guidelines. So I just kind of want to say this that we. <laughs> I have been following CDC guidelines and did clear this conversation with you. And we were outside for a reason. <laughs> and unfortunately, I had it not that long ago as well. So. Right. So I just want to yeah. just want to just really be really upfront for that. that. I've been vaccinated. I've had two booster shots. But the BA5 variant is a different type. And I think they're going to come up with a vaccine that works with that this yeah. fall but not yet. So now it's moved into endemic phase, not a pandemic. It's something we're gonna to have to learn to live with. Yeah, yeah, well, you're certainly, I think, still enjoying your vacation, even, yeah. though, even if it's not exactly what you'd hoped. At well, I'd hope, to go out for, I'd hope to go out for a scramble with you, and it's like, I couldn't keep up with anyway, but now I really couldn't keep <laughs> up with you. So it's like, dang, yeah. that is, it is unfortunate, but that's the way, it has nothing to do with Europe. It just has to do with the world right now. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, well, how far into your trip are you? Uh, let's see. I mean, we've been here for four weeks. Okay. So, yeah. so four weeks, and then you said you're doing 11 total? Th that's actually backing up to, I, I, I left Moab, where we were, spent mm -hmm, the spring, mm -hmm. did a race outside of Grand Junction, did a race in Michigan, did Mount Washington Road Race in New Hampshire. I, mean, I did my <laughs> eastward migration. <laughs> <laughs> then came over and did the VK here. The next day was the marathon here. And was it a week later? I get it all mixed up now. The Grand Trail Cormier 30K over in Cormier. Nice. How was that one? That was good. Doug identified that one. Noting that obviously, or maybe not obviously, Cormier is right on the other side of the tunnel. It's like yeah. the Italian version of Chamonix. Mm -hmm. So it's got the steeps also. It's got the tradition. It's... Uh, really has a lot of tradition, yeah, doesn't it? I think, it? if I'm not mistaken, that trail is organized by the same folks who do the Tour des Géants. Right. Yeah. The Tour des Géants people, they're really good. They're really into it. They got the terrain. And as they tend to do here in Europe, which you know very well, you start downtown. There's something about this I really like. Instead of you know, going out in the wilderness, I, I, we like wilderness, we like being out in the back country, et cetera, et cetera. There's something about starting right down the center of the town, right next to the church. You know, that's the center, that's the classic, that's where they've been doing this for the past 100 years. And then you're going through these cobblestone narrow alleyways and finally you break out and then you go up, 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 up and up. You know, the refuge of Breton, the refuge of Walter Bonatti, and then you go, eh, and you're just kind of going like this. And there's this woman walking around you. It looks like she'd come out of the Milan fashion show. You're dodging them. That is something people that's People are drinking wine. About yeah, people are just drinking wine. They're just looking full on, full dress. You're kind of coming to, eh, you know, just heading for the finish line. I kind of like it. Yeah. I feel integrated. I feel like you're part of the mountain culture here. So actually, I wish I should have done my done my research on this before. But did you know that back, like, I think at least 150 years ago, the uh, the guides and the Chamonix Guide Company actually did a race. Only the guides did it from downtown Chamonix, right by the church, same place UTMB and uh, Mont Blanc Marathon start up Brevant and back down. Nice. So like, this really has been part of that historic culture for a long time. The Killian FKT. You know, start for Mont Blanc, start at the church. Of course, another side, uh, you know, the same thing oh, for exactly. Zermatt, for the Matterhorn. They're starting at the steps of the church. Yeah. But you, Hillary, you know, I mean, why Why am I talking about this? <laughs> I mean, you're, you're second twice at the Dolomite Sky Race. And, of course, 2018. Talk about steeps. You won handily because you won, let's see, what was it? The <laughs> Tromso, Killian's Race up in Norway. And Trofeo Kima, which is considered the hardest race. It's really cool. I love that race. <laughs> okay, translation. It's super hard, super steep. Almost people drop out left and right. Really cool is the other way to put it. 
really fun. So just keep in mind, translate what this woman is saying. You got to make the adjustments here. But you walked away from oh, the Glen Coast Kine Line. Yeah. So you did the big three, the three extremes, and you won them all. Yeah, 20, in one year. 2018 was a pretty great year for me. Um, and I think a lot of that came from, you know, you were evoking that the style of steep, you know, kind right. of gnarly races, what you like. And that's what I seek out as well. Before I became a runner, I was more, I did climbing and skiing and, you know, a bit of hiking. But for a long time, I actually thought I hated running um, I, because I thought it was something you did on the roads. Interesting. And then I started hiking. I started looking at maps and saying, boy, do you think I could go from there to there? You know, like, I wonder if I could do this and going through really cool terrain that motivates me. Right. So I think that that's something maybe that we have in common is that in order for me to sign up for a race, and it's my personal thing, is I want to be intrinsically motivated by the course. The course. Yeah, it's not, yeah. Just, I mean, some people are really motivated by competition. I love a good competition, but for me, I want to be doing races on in cool, cool terrain. Right, right. That's such a good point. That's a good perspective, and that's why you're doing it here. I thought it was interesting. If, Ten minutes ago, you said you've hardly ever raced in the States. Yeah, that's true. I, I've done a couple. Actually, my first ever trail race was the Great Adirondack Trail Race in uh, Keene, New Hampshire. Or Keene, New York. Sorry, do you right. know that one? I don't. I recommend it. Okay. I recommend it. It goes through. And this is actually, I, I'd love a little bit of your take on this because you know, this question of like, why don't we get the same kinds of races in the US? Um, and I know it's something that you definitely have thought a lot about. This, the, the Great Adirondack Trail Race goes through the giant mountain wilderness in the Adirondacks. Mm -hmm. And, but the way they have to do it, because it's a wilderness area, is it's kind of like a, um, a time trial. They let one person ah, go out of time. Um, interesting. And so it really changes kind of the experience in that also when you're on the trail if you see someone else you know they're at least a minute ahead or a minute behind you so you're not like elbowing to get out of the way right it's like where everybody's doing their own race but as east coast style is a the, gnarly the beast know, coast yeah i mean the, the big famous stuff is out west yeah. in the states obviously you know from hard rock to states to everything else but the beast coast is for real and the people from new england they don't you know they know it and you go there and they don't do switchbacks. <laughs> Out west in the United States, everything's big. I mean, that's where all the big famous races are, particularly the ultras. Ultras somehow took over the United States about 20 years ago. The United States likes bigger equals better, which I don't think is true. I think quality is more important, but leaving that aside. You know, I think, I mean, you're kind of preaching to the choir, <laughs> only because I, I don't personally ultra run, so I obviously think that what I do is the best, but. <laughs> Otherwise you wouldn't do it. Exactly, no, mm -hmm. but I see it as, it's a, just a different discipline. Yeah. That's, that's my personal take on it. But. Right, exactly. And here's the thing which a lot of people don't realize, all the trails, literally all the trails were made for pack animals. Mm. It's made for horses and burros and they actually constructed the trails. Back east, no, it was for people. And so they don't do switchbacks. Switchbacks are for pack animals, not for people. That's and so you're going out to the you know, high summits, you know, either the A46ers or the New Hampshire 54s. Man, those go up, like Mount Marcy, you the highest ones in Vermont. You, and you know, that's, that's New York, but you know, uh, in Vermont, Mansfield, yeah. man, you're going, eh, eh. you're going right up the fall line. Yeah. So we can't, we got to honor the Beast Coast for sure. Awesome, yeah. But here's the other little distinction, Hillary, if you don't mind me no, making this please. perspective. It all comes down to the permit. Okay. That's really what the deal is. We have terrain there. That's not an issue. Go to the Canadian Rockies, any place like that. It's really, really good in North America, but you can't pull the permit. Okay. Here you can. Here they support it, right? Look at Sham. Uh, you know, the Dolmi Sky Race, uh, which was last, well, the whole weekend in uh, Val Gardena in, in northern Italy. Th here's the race packet. Here's this big, long letter from the mayor, right, mm -hmm. and from the governor. They're totally into it. Everybody supports it. Just the municipality supports it. The businesses support it. Everybody's on board. In the States, there's this weird schism. Mm. 
mm. where sport is like this other thing and then environmentalism and protecting the environment or something else. And that's wrong thinking in my mind. John Muir said, take people to the Sierras, make them love the mountains, and then they come back and they vote the environment. Mm. John Muir, founder of the Sierra Club, had the two-pronged approach. And in the States, we've kind of split these. So environmentalists is kind of just being restrictionists. And while the recreationalists are over here, and those absolutely are together in Europe, they should be together. Historically, they're more effective. There's no such thing as loving it to death. You know, it's all the same thing. So the more people go to the mountains, the more they enjoy it, the more they protect it, and then the environmental laws get passed. Europe has better environmental laws than the United States. I think that's one of the reasons. Talking about FKTs, the reason that I would maybe make that jump now is did that have anything to do with You are so right. event, so we're going to do this. I'm going to do this on my own. You are so correct. And so I like I I feel pretty confident that I know what an FKT is. Most of the <laughs> Run the Alps listeners are going to be and, and the audience <laughs> is American, so we're familiar with FKTs. We do get some folks from other parts of the world um, who might not really know. Can you tell us a little bit about what what is an FKT? The fastest known time is literal. In a race, you're going to have a stopwatch, it's going to be official, you're going to record it. The fastest known time means this is what we know to be the fastest time. It doesn't mean it's officially timed, but we established on fastestknowntime.com, Peter Backwin and I established guidelines and rules. And the whole idea is to give people a level playing field, give people a place to play so that they could do things all over the world and they could put their mark on the wall and they could go back there and be inspired. So a key thing on an FKT is you don't have to win. It's like a race. You don't have to win the race to enjoy the race. Same thing with this. You have a worldwide bucket list of cool routes, and there's the GPX file, there's the map, there's the description, there's photos, and you can go out and have a good time. So FKTs, just like races, cover the range. Anyone can participate, and you can do it anywhere you want, almost. There's FKTs set in urban environments, on beaches, on deserts, and in mountains, and in trails, mm -hmm. and off trails. So it's a lot more wide and broad. But Hillary, as you correctly noted, they came on really strong in the United States because you can't race the cool stuff. Okay. I mean, Hard Rock is very cool. That's a great course. But they let 145 people into it. Yeah, it's not that compared to the amount of people you yeah. put on the trails in Chamonix. I mean, 145 is exclusionary. I mean, you just kind of have to say that. Sorry about that. But Mount Whitney, rim to rim to rim on the Grand Canyon, right? Mm -hmm. This We've got fantastic terrain in North America that it is illegal to hold a race on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Boulder, I'm from Boulder, mm -hmm. and uh, it is in city code, illegal to have any competitive event on city open space. Wow. Which is bizarre. Boulder's known as the trail running capital, so it's actually the exact opposite of Chamonix, which supports it. Boulder wrote it in their code, you can't do any com competition of any kind. County of Boulder did the same thing. There's good terrain. You just can't race it, but you can do FKTs. And so that answers your question. Yeah. So, though, so I've got, this is in some ways playing a little bit of a devil's advocate here because, right, we saw, especially I think during COVID times, um, FKTs really were taken off. We also saw for something like the Golden Trails World Series, how did people qualify at that time for going to the Golden Trails Finals? It was based on Strava segments. Right. So, for the, for the you know, uninitiative, uninitiated, <laughs> What's the difference between a Strava, King of the Mountain, KOM, and an FKT? Well, there's, there's Strava segments. We don't know how many Strava segments there are. There's over a million. Maybe there's 10 million. We don't know. So anyone who wants to can just put up a Strava segment between two mailboxes out in front, and they could go do that. I believe that I actually have the um, you know, fastest known time or Strava segment from my house to my work. There you go. <laughs> You got it. Yeah, I established that. FKTs are curated. Okay. Everyone, every route has been personally, manually reviewed for authenticity mm. and veracity. If it doesn't count, if it doesn't matter, it's not an FKT route. We're not going to put it on the website. A Strava segment could be literally anything. So Strava is great. I love it. I use it every day. 
but they're, they're quite different. There's not that many FKT routes. And then to get an FKT, that has to be manually reviewed. Mm -hmm. There's a tremendous amount of work going on behind the scenes in that website. And I do know, so you're not doing that anymore, right? <laughs> This is uh. true. Yep, we sold the business. We sold fastestknowntime.com in March to Outside Inc. Okay, but I'm still, you know, gonna depend on you to answer some of my questions, even though, you know, you're, you're not behind the wheel anymore. But, so, do you think, then you said, that, like, that somebody, it's getting curated, right? Making sure these roots matter. I do totally agree with you. I end up sometimes with my, like, you know, Strava run, and I'm like, oh, I, like, I got second place on this 0.2 kilometer right. long thing, right? It's like, so, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> who cares? But my question is, are there an unlimited number of FKTs that could be established out there? What, like, what makes an FKT, you said it has to matter. What does that mean? <laughs> Peter, Peter Backman had the one-liner. Uh, it's like art. You know it when you see it. <laughs> okay. Now, we actually did tune it up from that more objectively, and it had to be at least uh, five miles long or 500 feet of elevation gain. Okay. So none of these little... You know, to, to, to the grocery yeah. store type stuff. Mm -hmm. And then the other one liner really is if someone's visiting, they want to say, that's cool, I want to go do that. Okay. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's still a little subjective, but other people have to want to do it. It's not just your own thing that no one else cares about. Mm -hmm. So my, my segment from my house to my work I can't, I can't get on there? Probably not. But uh, you just did this morning, La Junction. Mm -hmm. That's got like 5,500 feet of vert. However, I've actually, I got to look at my, I got to look at the, the GPS on it. I don't know if it's five miles to the top. Oh, you got the vert. Okay. La Junction qualifies. You're going up, <laughs> you know, there's these two glaciers. And it's coming up to the point right between it. So it's... Right. That qualifies. Put that on your hit list, you know. Yeah, that qualifies yeah. easily. So that's an easy FKT route. Okay. And because it's competitive, people do it all the time. I was going to say, it's not an, F an easy FKT to get, but. Not a very good point. Yeah. <laughs> very hard FKT to get because it's competitive. If you go on Strava, what, a thousand people have given it a go. Oh, surely, at least. Yeah. Uh, well, much more than that. Probably a thousand a year. Right. Do you see it catching on in Europe or the rest of the world, South America, in Asia? <laughs> is it, uh, what's it going to take? Are we going to see a big boom of FKTs? Uh, let's back it up a little bit, which is to say that the mountain culture here, as we talked about a few minutes ago, predates that in the States. This goes back forever. And as you were commenting, there used to be races that you can't, that are almost prehistoric. That's how long they've been going on. So the FKT culture has been going on all over Europe, all over the UK, and the United States, we coined the term. That's okay. all we did. So this is an important distinction. So the day our website, new website went live, the first person to kick in was some guy named Killian. You might have, oh, the name might sound familiar. And he sent me this big spreadsheet, and so he'd been keeping track of all this stuff and so forth. So let's be real clear, Europe, the Alps has been into this forever. They just didn't have that name for it. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to standardize it with that website, but we didn't invent anything. Mm -hmm. and it's just like we didn't even, I don't even think, you know, Europe invented trail running or racing, right? There's a lot of indigenous right. uh, communities that have been doing that stuff for a long time. Right, you go to the Southwest. If you want to go way back, the Southwest, indigenous tribes of uh, the Hopis, the Navajo, I mean, the Dine, they've been doing this a long time. And in terms of the Western culture, the UK, fell running, right? Mm. I mean, we call it trail running, they call it mountain running here, they've always called it fell running, and they've been doing that a long time. And of course, the rounds, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the Bob, the Bob Graham round, and of course, the Finley round, they have three big rounds there, and there's things we you and I have never heard of they've been doing forever yeah. and instead of using GPS trackers on the on the bob someone has someone to has witness to you on the top of every summit you got, you got this little piece of paper and they're kind of going like that but that's how long they've been doing it so I'm really happy with what we did fastest known times we put it on the map 
China, Japan, South America. It is certainly worldwide. And we just pulled in what was happening elsewhere into a coherent fashion. You see what I mean? Yeah. And so if there was a winter record in the UK, we use their calendar dates. It just isn't the same as the geographic winter. Mm -hmm. Like winter is the, the winter solstice, the spring equinox, but that's not how they do it. They do it December 1st to March 1st. So we said, okay, that's how you're doing it. That's what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Yeah. So local tradition is, takes priority. Okay. So you were talking about seasons, and actually earlier in our discussion, you were talking about, you know, climate change. We're in the middle of a heat wave right now. We're outside, fortunately in the shade, but it's far too hot. Um, one of the things that I was actually kind of curious about is some of the roots, right, that have these established oh, times in, on them are getting irreparably changed by climate change. So I, you know, even something pretty recent, um, and this is actually now it is back to being an organized race on the Monte Rosa Sky Marathon. I did it in 2018, which was the year that Emily Forsberg did the best women's time when she did a team with Killian on that. And we had the first thousand meters on trail and then we got on snow and we had 2,500 meters of snow up to the top of the Signal Koopa and then turned around and ran back down. And a quick note, yeah. team is required. There's mm -hmm. no such thing as solo. You have to be in a rope this, team and you have, to, race, you have yeah. to know what you're doing. Yeah, you're roped up on the glacier. But so then I did it again this year and mm. we had 2,500 meters of climb and then only 1,000 meters on snow. That's and a I big difference. And I can tell you that running down trails as hard as you can for 2,500 meters is a lot different on your knees and stuff than being able to glissade down snow. And it got me thinking, you know, like, I wonder if her time can ever be beaten. Interesting. Same goes on the oh, Mont Blanc yeah. route yeah. here in Chamonix. The, you know, we're in a particularly hot year right now, but we didn't get enough snow. Those crevasses in the junction are wide open. There's a crevasse on the ridge of Mont Blanc. Could the best times ever be done again on, on those routes? Will those routes be able to be done? So I'm just curious about what your thoughts are. Certainly these are two, ex you know, two examples from my own experiences, but other places we're seeing big, huge impacts of climate change on some of the trails that we run. What, what happens when a trail can't be done yeah, anymore? Yeah, right. Well, f I think, as you would agree, Hillary, we have to contextualize this and say climate change affects the entire planet, checks ag affects agriculture, yeah. particularly affects people who live close to sea level, entire country of Bangladesh, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely. And so I'm not going to complain about trail running. I just, just kind of have to just contextualize this a little bit. There's, this is a big problem and it affects us that much because we're privileged mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. We just kind of have to. Yeah, <laughs> I, I would add to that though, even though I entirely agree with you that this Chamonix, right, and Courmayeur and Saint-Gervais and all of these places where the entire economy is oh, based that, that's true. on being able to use these mountains, it does have, well, it may not be, well, in some cases it is a life or death impact on on people's lives right. with it being quite dangerous but um and we saw with the marmalata glacier right but um the chamonix guide company has had they've canceled all of their mont blanc trips for the rest of the year the saint gervais company as well the trevinia guides in italy have just canceled all of their uh matterhorns for the rest of the year oh, they canceled the matterhorns too because it's the permafrost melt so right. like the the communities that depend on this are being economically impacted in a pretty big way right uh, but you're right that in terms of, you know, big scale, we're not having the same kind of impact as a lot of other parts of the world are seeing. Right, but, right. But, Rec the, but we are here to talk about trail running. <laughs> Rec <laughs> Recreation is good. Yeah. <laughs> and they did, indeed, they closed the regular route in Mont Blanc about a week ago for that mm -hmm. very reason. I didn't know the guide companies just shut down the business. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. It is also is a little particular to here and to a certain degree South America in the Himals. If you go to North America, we don't really have that much glaciology. It's not that big of a thing. So it, it gets hot and mm -hmm. that's about it. And maybe drought. 
Interestingly enough, the way it affects us in North America is wildfires. I mean, we uh, pulled, before we sold the business, I pulled the Pacific Crest Trail off the premier FKT status. It's not a premier route anymore. I don't know if you're ever going to be able to do it again. Mm -hmm. Just like what you just said. Is, is the Mozons Glacier ever going to be done again? It's like, whoa, you, yeah. you need different conditions because crevasses you can't mess with. Yeah. Doesn't matter how you know this better than I do. Doesn't matter how fit you are. <laughs> <It doesn't. laughs> Technical, gear, fit, experience, doesn't matter. You don't want to fall in a crevasse yeah. Yeah. or have the rock come down from the permafrost melting. Yeah. I mentioned uh, we were in the Bernice Oberlin on a Run the Alps trip here uh, three weeks ago. Did Eiger Trail, going by the infamous Nordwand. Mm -hmm. You're looking up there and it's like, no, 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 not happening. And you know, like Uli's uh, FKT was done on that was in November. Mm -hmm. So the, the speed records, when they, before they stopped doing them all together, were done in November to get it frozen back up. So in terms of the routes here, yeah, they are definitely being affected. Yeah. Yeah, I think we'll see a bunch of changes in terms of what's possible mm -hmm. even to do. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the clock is ticking. Time is flying. The clock is ticking. Um, I think it is. Yeah, I didn't look at my watch at the beginning. But so I'm actually, I'm just, you can't look at my notes. I've got a lightning round of well, questions for can you. Can I do something else first? Yes, you can. What is your perspective? You know that you asked my perspective. I've been here for four and a half weeks. You live here. You're a resident, I think. You actually work here. You're a top athlete. I mentioned what your 2018 was. You also won the 90K Mount Blanc just last year. Speaking of not being an ultra runner, 90K is like, <laughs> hmm, I, da I dabble. Let I dabble. me do the numbers on that. <laughs> and you're, you're, you're going back to uh, the Kima Trophy again, Trophy mm -hmm. Kima, which is considered the stoutest, hardest race. So what do you think, Hilly? You're obviously going to stay here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the interesting things about being here and uh, is that, um, so the Alps, this is, you know, I, I we're talking about climate change, I think, particularly the Alps are warming about twice as fast as the rest of um, the Northern Hemisphere mm -hmm. on, on average. And so we're seeing pretty big changes happening at a pretty mm -hmm. fast pace. Mm -hmm. This year, for example, we're getting a lot of first evers. Um, and, you know, I think that there, there are sort of two things, right? On the one hand, um, outdoor recreation is super important and getting out in the mountains and appreciating those landscapes will continue to inspire people to want to take action that'll protect them. Um, I also think that, you know, things are going to change and they're going to change a lot. And we have to see to what extent are we able to adapt as quickly, you know, mm -hmm. as we need to. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I certainly see it. My husband's a mountain guide as well. Uh, and so Th does that mean he is no. out of work to some degree or is he going to do like more rock climbing, well, lower so this cragging? This is like a, an example of the ad some of the adaptations that we have to make, you know, both in terms of policy and all of that, but then also where are we going what are we doing and you know you're choosing your roots right based on how hot it is mm. <laughs> during the day um and he's going to be you know he kind of finished the high mountain alpine climbing he said i'm not going up there anymore now he's doing more lower rock climbing stuff that's not on permafrost terrain ah. so he's fortunately not all out and he just yet. said that he said it's just too dangerous he made that decision yeah like wow. a lot of guides have He's lucky because he also works as a biologist, uh, so he has another job as well. Diversify, right? Um, okay. But it's interesting. I was when I so I just took three days to do the chemo, the Trophio Chemo route over three days because I love it so much there, and I'm always going so fast you can't really <laughs> take in the views. <laughs> Um, and I wanted to be able to really experience that and talk to the hunt caretakers, and they were talking about the fact that you know they hope they'll have enough water for the end of the season you know because mm. they depend on snow melt uh that they're seeing you know mm. big changes so these changes are coming um and you just got to figure out how to live with them and how to you know the it's going to go like this and then we've got a bunch of scenarios right that that go like it's going up it's going to ho get hotter and hotter lots of changes and then where it goes from sort of about 2050 mm. is like really up to us at this point so right up to us yeah Okay, well, thank, 
Thank you. You're welcome. I could talk about it for a long time. <laughs> um, but I'm going to just, you know, lighten things a little bit here. And I've got a lightning round. A couple questions. You ready? Yeah. All right. Favorite place you've been so far on this trip? Oh, why? I'm not too lightning. I, I'm going to say, tick, talk, tick. I think La Junction. I like La Junction because I like the, the efficiency of it. You didn't have to take a train, didn't have to drive, didn't have to do anything. Start right here, right at the hub, where anyone can come and rent this and do what I did, and just ran out there and went to the top and came back down. Yeah. I was, I was there this morning. It's a great place. All right. Croissant or pain au chocolat? Pain au chocolat. I don't get croissant. Oops. Should I have said that? You I might mean, get deported. I might get deported. I mean, pastries are just this massive cultural thing here. I'm not a, I'm not, I'm not a pastry right. eater, really. Right. So then it would be pastries or cheese. I don't even eat dairy. Oh, oh no. no. I'm messing <laughs> up the lightning round. All oh, right, okay, okay. Actually, let I'll me back me. up. Can I back up and amend this one? <laughs> Okay. So, I don't eat dairy except when we're in the Bernese Overland, on this Run the Alps trip that mm -hmm. they set up for us. You're out there and there's all these cows, as you know, and they're like eating flowers. They're eating nothing but wild flowers. And they come into the barn twice a day. They're milked twice a day. They're made, their cheese is made right in that barn. Mm -hmm. And then they're doing these self-service cheese dispensers <laughs> up above I the nearest roads. So I was totally eating cheese. That's the best quality cheese in the world. And so I have to amend my previous statement. Okay, okay. Well, Sorry. <laughs> All right, a couple more questions. Poles or no poles? Poles. Okay. Well, mostly, I mean, again. Depends on the terrain. It depends on the terrain. Like on the VK, poles are just going to get in your way. Yeah, yeah. So. You gotta use your hands a little. Right. All right, uh, true or false? You were named after the military style haircut. False. How about the carrion bird? False. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> Running belt or pack? Oh, uh, I'm still okay with, uh, I basically invented the vest, of course, <laughs> with ultimate direction, but I'm okay with belts. Mm -hmm. I don't have that much stuff to carry. So if I'm out for a really long time, I use the vest, but generally the belt works okay for me. Yeah, I use them quite a bit too. Depends on the length of the run. Right. Yeah. All right, last question. Have you seen a Dawu since you arrived here? I, whoa, you got me with a trick question, Hillary. Mm. Look at that. Mm. Okay. Uh, Do you want to tell them what a Dawu is? I was trying to decide whether I should answer yes or no without knowing what it is. Oh, ah, okay. Well, the Dawu is the famed mountain beast uh, here that we have in the Chamonix Valley. And more generally, you see them around in the Alps. And they actually have evolved to have one half of like their their oh. legs on one side are shorter so mm. that they can traverse around the mountain they can do the belson nord and the belson sud much but those better. are two different they're two different they have to species go. oh there's, i there's, see one well, got a short left leg and i got yeah, a short right one leg. endemic population over there <laughs> and one endemic population over there well i guess my answer is i was becoming one okay all right <laughs> you were evolved i was even I was adapting. I was evolving. Uh, evolution was taking place in the span of a few speed, weeks. Speed. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for answering those silly questions. Now, we did, as I said, get a couple questions oh. sent in for you. Okay. Um, so, first. They, they've got to be easier than those. Those okay. are pretty, those were tough. Well, yeah, well, this one, you could, you could, I mean, it's up to you if you just want to answer some of them with a simple yes or no, but I don't think that's your style. Uh, so, Don from Crested Butte wrote in and said, so what do you prefer for trail running? The more low-key, or trail racing, excuse me, the more low-key scene in the U.S. or the more hyped-up scene in Europe? Hyped. I know it sounds odd, but it's an easy I answer for me. It's basically, if it's low-key, I'm just going to go by myself. I'm going with Peter, I'm going with Skirka, I'm going with my son Galen, I'm, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if I'm going to, you know, peel off the money and enter the race, I want to race. You know what I mean? I want, to, you know, kind of bump an elbow here. That's, that's what I want to do. <laughs> All right. That's a good answer. Uh, Kristen in Hanover, New Hampshire said, what's the gender mix like out on the trails in the Alps? Is it more balanced? Ooh. She says she gets the sense that families and couples are a little more active in Europe, but in the U.S. the trail running scene feels still maybe a little bit macho. 
Just a guess, she said. Wow, What's your impression? I think she was sharp. I like that question quite a bit. And we've been observing this as we go to different places. So, for example, we just came back from the Dolomites, Belgardine, and so forth. In Italy, it's full. It's the folks. You know, it's not tourists up there. It's Italian. 99% of the people were Italian. It's families. They're pushing baby strollers over technical terrain. It was really fun to see. So I, I like that. I, I found the mountain culture alive and well in Italy. Here, it's l definitely more tourist, a little more hardcore here. here. In Chamonix. There's so many people get tired just being here, I think, because, you know, it's kind of like that. I actually live 10 minutes out of town that way. Just so you can it's chill. It's a little too tiring <laughs> downtown for me. Right. And it's the, nice for vacation, but to live. In the Swiss Alps, I thought it was more mixed. Mm -hmm. I think the gender balance has always been better in the States mm. than it has been in the Alps. That's what I've seen. You look at the numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, Title IX changed the world. That's just a slightly different topic, but Google Title IX, it changed the world. We were the first. Mm -hmm. Sarah in Bozeman wrote in, um, I really enjoyed listening to Buzz's FKT podcast, mm -hmm. anything else in the works? And that actually lines up with one of my last questions for you, which is, you don't really, you, even having moved to a new age category, you don't <laughs> seem like the kind of guy who's going to like sit around and play shuffleboard. <laughs> oh, what? Do you say so? Oh, so, what? what's next? What did, you got anything coming? I love shuffleboard. Don't you? I've I, never played shuffleboard. I don't know. I'm, I'm <laughs> making a very unfair judgment of shuffleboard. Shuffleboard is actually kind of fun. <laughs> but, uh, wow, that's a sharp question. You have a sharp question. And I am on a group call. What time is it? 1.45. In uh, five hours and 15 minutes to talk about what is next. Okay. So I think something is going to be announced fairly soon. Oh. Well, I think that's about all that we have time for today. Since we are at the hub, so you know, I went, as soon as I let you go, you can go lounge below a nice shaded tree. Hot tub. Or if you want to do your heat training, yeah, you do hot tub during the heat wave. Free bikes to go uh, to the grocery store. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Next month, for example, did you know that Run the Alps has a trip with, you mentioned Hard Rock a couple times, Courtney DeWalter. Oh yeah, Co yeah, Courtney is the, the best female ultra runner in the world we could pretty much say. Yeah, I think, I think that's fair. <laughs> I think that's fair to say. Pretty soon or even now, if you're really ahead of schedule, you can sign up, start signing up for 2023 trips and we'll be dropping a bunch of those coming up. Um, thank you also just to our Run the Alps Rendezvous producers. We've got Alexandra Yanyak, uh, who's behind the camera, <laughs> Jen Stratton, Kim Strom, and thanks to The Hub for letting us film here. And a shout out to poor Doug Mayer, who founded Run the Alps and is homesick today, uh, hopefully getting good puppy cuddles with his dog Izzy. Um, and thanks everybody for tuning in and happy trail running. Thanks, Hillary. <laughs>